Well, hello there, everyone. It's good to see you here again. And thanks so much for joining me here today. If we haven't met yet, or if you are new here, my name is Christelle. I'm co-founder of Canvas Club and the Creative Crafting Club. And my sister, Stefani, and I teach women how to start, grow, and profit from kids' crafting clubs. We primarily focus on steam-based crafting, and we use a lot of recycled materials to craft with. It's a lot of fun. So today, we're going to dive into session three of our four-part series. Um, the series is called, uh, let me just grab my banner there for a sec. The series is called How to Let Go and Manage Perfectionism When Crafting with Kids and the Harm If You Don't. So just to do a quick recap, um, in the last two sessions, we focused on the harm if parents and teachers don't learn to let go of control and perfectionism when crafting with kids. And then we also discussed last week why we struggle as parents and teachers to let go. So if you've missed that, um, please grab the link in the comments below. Stefani will share the link. And then also let me know where you're watching from. I'm still in beautiful Cape Town. I'm looking up your onto Table Mountain and it's a gorgeous day in Cape Town. And then also if you are a member of the Creative Crafting Club, as always, please give me a hashtag CCC in the comments and it's lovely to have you here again. So before we dive in, I want to remind you of the brand new freebie that we created specifically uh, for this series. And it is a really fun quiz and you can find out how controlling you are when crafting with kids. And then also Marlene, um, who, are, who will be joining us now, also gave us five amazingly important ways to encourage creative freedom in an arts and crafts class. This is relevant for you when you are crafting with your own kids or if you are a teacher. So um, Stefani, if you would mind sharing that in the comments as well, the link for that, that'd be, be awesome. So let me let Marlene in. She's waiting patiently as always in our uh, waiting room. Hello Marlene, how are you? Hi, Crystal. It's lovely to be here. Uh, yes, I'm also from sunny Cape Town, and I see Kelly is from the UK. So, hi, Kelly. Um, welcome to you too. It's lovely to be here. Thanks, Crystal. Thanks, Marlene, for joining us again. And then, for those who um, we didn't watch the first two, Marlene is an occupational therapist, and she's a play therapist who works specifically in the field of mental health and well-being. So, without further ado, let me grab the theme for today is um, how to let go of control and perfectionism when crafting with kids. So if you struggle to let go, put your phone away, grab a pencil and take some notes. Um, today is going to be very informative and a very practical session. So let's jump right in. Marlene, last week we explored um, the reasons why we as adults hold on to control and um, how can we as parents and teachers practically keep ourselves from pushing our own needs onto our children. I'm so thrilled that today is the practical session because as an OT, you know, I love to get down and dirty and actually doing it. And I think it is important for us to understand. So if you haven't watched the previous one, guys, go and, go and have a look and really understand what we've been speaking about. But it's also the how, you know, we often get those questions, okay, I click what you're saying, but how are we doing this? And so I'm thrilled that we can speak about it today. You're right, Crystal. It is very hard. Um, I think it's so innate in us that we just almost don't really think about when we take control. And it's almost when we have taken control that it hits us smack bang in the head and we're like, oh my word, this was my craft project and not the child's craft project. So that's the tips that we're going to bring for you today. The first thing that I really want to speak about is kind of just that process that we started about last week, which says about reparenting. Um, so starting to think about your needs versus your child needs. And this is very difficult because as we've been saying, it's you're kind of busy and you're running around and as parents, as teacher, there's so many things in our head. But what I want to encourage people really on a practical level is to start to separate what is your needs versus what is your child's needs. So your needs, is to just get through this class. Um, your child's need is to have fun, or your need is to get out of the house as quickly as possible, um, but your child's need is actually to spend a moment looking for their missing sock. And so I think there's an importance in starting to separate that. So what we need to do for that, on a very practical level, is make some space for yourself for reflection. Often post an event or an incident where you kind of took over a little bit, and I mean, we know when we did. Um, take a moment and just think about that. Was that now about me 
or was that about the child? And this process of awareness will help you to start to notice when you are taking control. So that's kind of one of the first steps. Yes, uh, completely. I can actually relate. I'm thinking of an example of uh, we held a Mother's Day workshop in our studio and uh, parents, well, mothers specifically with their children came along. We did a crafting activity and the one mom came in and she said that she battled to sleep the night before because uh, she was she's not a confident crafter and she actually felt quite uncertain about um, that she had to be doing crafting that day. And she ended up doing an amazing job and it was a really fun event. But then the strangest thing happened. She actually at some point uh, we made these beautiful big canvas um, crafts and at some point her, her little daughter got quite a bit um, wild with the paint. It became quite messy. And she, when she left, she said, yeah, the, the, the artwork was so beautiful. You should have stopped the class 20 minutes before her child actually spoiled it. She messed it up and now she can't put it in, up in the house because it's, it's spoiled now. And it was an interesting observation because one, I, I was quite proud of the mom throughout the entire crafting experience because I thought here she was, she felt so shy and uncertain and insecure. And then as soon as she started crafting, she gained confidence and it was a very nice and collaborative project. And then towards the end, it was just like, damn it, you know, she, yeah, <laughs> yeah, the child's fault. There's the nothing fault. like a child with a paintbrush and a black streak going off a page to freak us parents and um, teachers out completely. We're just like, oh my word, what are you doing? Um, to both her and the child, it's so interesting that neither got what they wanted. Isn't that so sad? Because mom carried her own anxiety rather than separating her anxiety from the child's anxiety and the child just wanted to mess this thing up um so that's a perfect example of a mom that has to actually take a moment and ask herself what is this really about and i think this kind of fits into the fact that well, it's almost a little bit twofold is that as a parent you need, or a teacher, you need to also make space for yourself to nurture your own needs. Um, and mm. that might be this mom really needs to develop some skills in her confidence. And she's maybe busy and overwhelmed and she doesn't have that. A crafting club of her own and a little space where that she can go and enjoy it might be so beautiful and lovely for her. I am very aware that we are busy, that there's so much going on in our lives. But I don't think that we spend enough time healing our own needs and therefore we kind of project that onto our children. So taking some time for your own hobbies, taking some time for your own me time. And if you want to almost think about um, the concept of being contained. So the psychiatrist um, Donald Winnicott, beautiful, speaks about the container containing. And so if you as a parent or a teacher, if you are contained in yourself, you are able to contain and so creating some space of your own um maybe a craft class is not in your budget and maybe a craft class is not in your time capacity but go for a walk on your own take a shower and in that shower just rub and smell and do your thing and take some time for you to nurture you so that when you're with your child you can be with your child and that you don't have to take that anxiety from your own space into your child's space if that makes sense it makes a lot of sense. And please let us know in the comments if you can relate to any of this. Um, I spoke to my sister-in-law yesterday and she's got a toddler at the moment and a newborn and she's on maternity leave. And she said to me that she does not have time to read. She does not have time. At most, she can listen to a podcast every now and then. But uh, her her need at the moment is to be... Um, you know, to, to gain practical tips. Like if she's got struggles at, in life, like don't talk for too many hours. Just like give give me like practical tips is what she said. So Marlene, I actually, um, I really appreciate all your practical advice today because I, for instance, was thinking like, where am I going to find time? The shower. What a fantastic practical tip. Um, because I understand we need to be quite aware of ourselves when we engage with children. And um, I mean, to, to be able to gain mindfulness around the, you know, when you are present with a child is really important. I just want to quickly say hello here. I see there's a, quite a few people before we go further. Um, Adonia, welcome. She's one of our members. And then I see Lily is here from beautiful Cape Town. She's also a member. And then you also welcomed um, Kelly um, from the UK earlier. So thanks, guys, for joining us today. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, I hear you, Crystal. I, I think, and I feel your sister-in-law's pain as well, Nia, because there is so little time. And I think it is about making that time, but being clever about it, you know, especially as first-time parents or as parents of multiple children, and, and it gets quite hectic if you come to number three and there's a toddler and there's a six-year-old and, you know, like things are going crazy. Mm. Um, so it's almost working, you know, the, the typical saying of work smarter rather than harder. So it's Taking normal everyday activities and making them your space. I'm thinking about the absolute chore of cooking, but mm. to kind of then go, okay, the partner, you take the kids now, and I'm actually going to take the cooking task, not as a chore, but I'm actually going to bake something nice or do something nice and make this normal activity my time. Um, mm. Or kind of sneaking off to get your hair cut, or like we said, go for a walk or enjoy that shower and making a normal activity your space. It's also about working kind of clever with your time. And I mean, we spoke about Peppa Pig last week and we know that we don't want super much screen times for our children, but when your child is busy on your, the screen, maybe that is the five minutes that you can quickly page through a magazine. Yeah. I'm not just reminded of something is that if we are really in this series saying, do not be so hard on children, don't let go a little bit. I almost want to say the same advice counts for us. Mm -hmm. Like you can also let go a little bit. Mm -hmm. And I think that links into another beautiful tip. And that is that when you are with your child, or when you are in that class, we spoke last week about bracketing, but can you just bracket that time too? Can you really be present? So I almost want to suggest now we are going to do a messy paint activity like that poor mom had to do. Take a breath mm -hmm. and say, phone aside, Worries aside, comparison aside, what the neighbors will say aside, whether this picture will be beautiful on the fridge or not, put that all aside and just be in the moment. That is the gift that children gives us. They are like beautiful picture, black paint. I like that. This is what <laughs> I feel like right now. And so I think we can learn from children about letting go by just actually being with them. Um, I, I'm reminded now of a family that I know where the four or five year old said to the mom, Mom, you are here, but you are not really here. And it fills me with sadness that we are spending time with our children and we're spending time in classes, but we are just so distracted by our lives and our worlds and our stresses. And so part of letting go is letting go of all of the nonsense and actually being present, specifically if you've shaped out that time already to be with your child and so i think that's really important i love that i love that so it's quite clear that there's quite a bit of work and self-care needed for our own development and then you started just mentioning a few ideas of what you can do when you are with a child would you mind elaborating a little bit more on that topic Yes, because now that's about the fun. Yeah, that's exactly where the children are teaching us how to be. And so a big tip for me is to really focus on the process rather on the product. Once again, your example of the mom's great, because that was all about the product. It was all about this beautiful picture that I will have at the end of the day and that I will put up in a room. And so it's not really about that when we are crafting, it's about the process. So if you can start to focus with your child or the child in your class, rather on the process. So instead of saying, oh, this is a beautiful picture or this is the most beautiful tree, you can rather say, oh, I like how you make the tree or oh, I find it interesting that you played with colors a little bit. Oh, that's so strange. You put a leaf there and a can you hear that just the way of talking is that we are speaking about the process and so we're taking away the judgment we're taking away that fear of failure for the child because we're not saying we are expecting you to have a perfect beautiful little product we are actually saying oh we loved how you thought about sticky tape rather than glue and that was beautiful and so that's what we're saying when we say focus on the process rather than on the product so in the Sorry, Marlene, so in our lesson plans within the membership, uh, the Creative Crafting Club membership, uh, we teach um, our members and we share ideas on, on that specifically, on the entire process. So, uh, for instance, a class would be a theme-related class, say, for instance, jellyfish, and then we would play, uh, we would take a break in the middle and we would play a jellyfish-related game just to get, you know, the blood flowing again. And then we also introduce materials quite slowly throughout the process so that... 
uh, the, the children can actually have time to to engage with each material at a time and uh, and then we, we have discussions on brainstorming ideas as to what you can do with that type of material and how you can work with the you know the, the um, materials that you have available so it ties in quite well with that it does it does so beautifully because what, what you're doing is also then bringing a sensory experience and there's you cannot be present if you are not in your body if you are in your head you are not present so to be in your body is to be present and to be in your body is to work with your senses so to sit and to smell to sit and to touch to sit and to pull to sit and to shape it differently and to play with the materials before we use it is a beautiful way of getting into our bodies and this is something that i want to suggest to parents and to teachers is to rather than kind of sit anxiously waiting for your child to do something and intervene in their product can you kind of keep yourself busy either with a parallel product so you're doing your own thing whilst they are busy with that which can kind of keep you a little bit contained and almost like say like keep your hands busy so that you don't get involved in their crafts but maybe for you you can sit and play a little bit with the material or you can sit and kind of sort out through some stuff and kind of keep yourself a little bit busy whilst your child is busy with the crafting product so that you don't feel the need to constantly be influenced so think about a child in parallel play two children doing the same thing but just doing next to each other and we are commenting on each other's products and we are kind of engaging and joking and, and chatting but i'm not doing your product and you are not doing my product if parents you are doing your own product please make some mistakes and don't work so hard at making it perfect like that mom did and then for you it's also about the product also make it for you about the sensory process then so yeah. that can be lovely to engage with I think the idea of running a parallel project is a fantastic tip, especially for crafting club teachers, because I often find, especially at the beginning of when I started running kids crafting classes, it was quite easy to, you know, um, teacher, I can't cut this and just to take over and to assist. And uh, one of our teachers, Lily, um, she actually taught me quite a bit about not touching the work of children and her photos that, uh, that she often takes of classes are just incredible because you can see that there was not an adult who touched those projects it really looks like jackson pollock paintings and the spontaneity of a child i i often think that those are the artworks that belongs in you know the modern uh, the moma museums modern art galleries and those kinds of places because they are just so spontaneous and beautiful and creative and then marlena i'm um, I, I think of another example now of, I mean, I've seen this actually quite a few times where uh, parents have stepped in because um, we we uh, invite parents to come along to our two age groups, the ages two to three and the ages four to six. And I've mm -hmm. often seen the parents would, would say, no, don't color that tree pink. Uh, you know, the leaves, leaves are green. Here's a green crayon, color it in green. And uh, I just wanted to touch on the developmental stages of children as well, because that's something that we, we teach within our membership as well, so that you can understand what the parameters are and the skill sets are of children in different ages. So ages two to three, that is the scribble phase. So, I mean, I've seen it with my son. He's two years old now. And I've, I mean, you, you can just imagine you've seen it with lots of children as well. So a two, two to three year old can, they can hold a pen, a crayon or a brush and they can start making random marks and dots and lines on the surface. And if, you, if you're not careful on my bedroom walls as well. So um, some children may start naming their drawings. I know my son will say, uh, cat you know and then he will start scribbling but he i mean he, he doesn't have the skill set yet to draw a cat um and then ages four to six that's the pre-schematic stage so uh, that's when when children start presenting things that they see in their environment so for instance you'll start seeing them drawing humans cars animals um, and the drawings will mostly be misplaced haphazardly on the page and it will be more emotional than logical. So these drawings are usually, you know, you've seen like those big heads uh, and, you know, with the small skinny arms or, you know, a cat double the size of of mommy, that kind of thing. So um, for ages four to six, colors are also extremely exciting. So they might color in, you know, <laughs> a head in blue and in green and in red, that kind of thing. So 
Um, I think the most important part with that age group, actually from ages two to six, is for them to explore every color in the box. And um, we often see our crafting club teachers and parents as well, where they want to say, okay, you can only use these two colors for today because you're making a tree. So here's brown and here's green. And I mean, I think as soon as you actually understand what the level um, and the skill set are of those children, then um, it makes it a lot easier, you know, to let go. So, and then the last one is the ages seven to 12, that's the schematic and the transitional stage. So, I mean, they start uh, demonstrating awareness of space and the colors are reflecting the real life colors and it's easy to define what they are doing. So, um, I know that we, we roughly discussed, you know, letting go of specifically parents in crafting classes as well. And with colors, I mean, I've seen it again and again and again. Do you have some practical tips as to how we can manage those kinds of things? Well, I think I think you've kind of given the answer there because it's beautiful. I think it helps. Re it helps a lot. And I mean, as a parent or a teacher, you don't have to know every stage of development to a T, but kind of know where the child is actually about. We want to have realistic limits as well as realistic expectations for children. So we want to say that, and I mean, we spoke about this last week. Create those parameters and say. Um, a scissor for a two-year-old is too dangerous. We're not going to give them, or like a knife. We're not going to do that. That's dangerous. So we're setting those parameters to keep the, the child safe. But yes. we are also allowing the child to explore. And I think that's the Jackson Pollock's art. That's what we want to say. Like, explore. If the tree is blue and the bird is, I don't know, orange, well, probably they're all orange birds, but if that is so, let it be. If you are taking paint and you're smearing it across allow the child to explore because it is through playing and exploring that a child learns. And so I think it's very helpful if you kind of have a vague idea of what your child is capable of or needs to be capable of in this age. The danger with this is that you step into a space of comparison. My two-year-old can do this. My three-year-old can do that. My five-year-old is... Oh, you know that saying where they say comparison is the thief of joy? Can mm. I just take that a step further and say your comparison is stealing your child's joy <laughs> because your child needs to just be plucking stuff on and smearing things around because they fall and it doesn't really matter. And I think this this need for us to have little prodigies and we have like this art child, it mm. creates so much tension for that child that we set unrealistic limits and unrealistic expectations for that child and that child does not feel free to just explore so as a parent set the safe boundaries as a teacher say what the child can and can't do let me think of a nice example um we're doing something with slime today. And so we're saying to the child, listen, if this is going to spill, remember it is sticky. It's gonna get it's gonna be difficult to get off your clothes. So a seven-year-old can comprehend that. And so we say, be careful of that. Know that if that happens, we're gonna have a bit of a mess. But now go and create your slime, put your stuff together, put your glitter all over. And so it's creating those safe parameters within the child's age appropriate norms. And I mean, it's lovely that you guys are presenting that in your membership. And I would really encourage people to then, then actually explore that a bit because that skill set or that understanding will help you so much. Um, yeah, I think also the other thing I'm just now noticing is also just as a parent or even as a teacher, we shouldn't be too scared to say sorry you know we shouldn't be too scared to admit that we've made a mistake if you have now taken that seven year old's whole slime project away from them and they are sitting there and they're like and you in that moment realize oh, oh i made him i can remember this so clearly i was a student and we had this activity um but as students we had a very limited budget but there was no pain for the children but we had two little groups and as this one group was playing and starting to exploring and exactly what you're saying, it's like messing with colors and putting it all over the page. I, in my anxiety to get the other group going, 
came and pulled the paint away <laughs> and took it to the other group of kids. And so I had very long faces and sad tears because I took the paint away. And it was such a valuable lesson. And for mm -hmm. me to then go, oh, guys, I'm so sorry. I didn't realize that you were still exploring and playing. So here's your paint back. And so we, we can do that. We can say, oh, sorry, here I wanted to do something. But why don't you do it? It's your project. And once again, we go back to that way of communicating and saying, what would you rather? Maybe this plan is interesting. And so I think a little bit of honesty and a little bit of openness in ourselves can help us to also be more present to help the child in their exploration. So, yeah, that's that's really some tips that we can think about. Yeah, and it's showing a bit of vulnerability is that's a life skill to, you know, to overcome. So I think and yeah, just to be vulnerable is a good thing for children oh. to see as well. So I love that. Marlene, do you have any other final thoughts or inputs before we get onto the really fun challenge for this week? I feel there's so much that we can still talk about. We can probably at least speak about this for ages. Um, I'm feeling like we're just getting going, but but you know what? I, I almost want to encourage you to think about why you want your child to be in the crafting class in the first place. Or if you are a teacher, why you are presenting this crafting class? Why are you even in this whole process? Um, and, I, and I think it's because we want to definitely help our children to learn and grow and all of those beautiful things. But it's mm -hmm. also because we want to create a space for creative and emotional self-expression. That is what it's all about. It's about letting a child be a child and naturally growing in that way. So be careful of wanting a perfect product. Be careful of having a beautiful wall through full of art pieces and bragging to the neighbors about what your two-year-old can do. And just allow the process to be natural, fun, and learning. And, and that is for teachers as well. If you're going to go into a class with such a rigid frame of, this unicorn statue should be like this with this hair. You are setting yourself up for failure and you're setting up the children for just unrealistic limits. So remember what crafting is really about. I love that. And Kelly, thanks for sharing your, your thoughts on this as well. It's definitely yeah. okay. Sorry. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I like that about setting the good example. If you as a parent or, or a teacher also just go, um, oh, I've made a mistake, e! and just go on. Yes. That's such a good example that you said for a child is to say, we're not taking this too seriously. Um, it's a spill. Just go, well, it's a spill, so we can clean it up. Um, yes. That's lovely, Kelly. Thanks for that. It reminds me of our quiz. Please be sure to grab the freebie because uh, there's there's an example of what you do if there's a spill on there in that quiz as well. It's really fun. Um, Marlene, the challenge for week three. Would you yeah. oh, I'm excited about the challenge. I am <laughs> going to find someone. Maybe Crystal, I'll come and do it with your little boy. Um, <laughs> so this week's challenge is all about practicing what we're preaching. Okay, so we are definitely going to do this week. We want you to think about a super, yeah, the word super messy activity okay so whether it's making slime for an older child or whether you're baking biscuits or muffins or cupcakes with another child maybe it's sand play i was laughing my sister was listening to our um chat last week and she was saying as we were busy with this um chat last week her little daughter was saying can she please use water for the sand and she said no we can't and my little niece said, but the recipe says we need water. And my sister immediately went like, okay, well, fine. Okay, we'll, we'll have water. It's fine. I'm letting go. So whatever messy play. <laughs> set aside like 10, 15 minutes for this messy play and set out the parameters. So say what they can do and what they can't do. Be very clear about what's dangerous and what you want them to do and what you don't want to do. Also be Clear about the time we're going to do this for 10 or 15 minutes. Um, and then, hands off, let go. Just be present with the child. Play, have fun, get messy yourself. If there is glitter all over the carpet, let there be glitter all over the carpet. So, yeah, that's the, that's the idea in a nutshell. Messy activity, set the parameters, and then explore, have fun, and just enjoy the time with your child. I've actually put my order in for uh, shaving foam. My husband's got a beard, so we never have shaving cream or shaving foam in, in the house. And I 
really want to play with shaving foam with my with my toddler. So I'm going to wow. put that into our messy play challenge. And I just do it in the bathroom, and then it's fine. You can just mess all over, and it's easy to wash. You see. It's cheating because it's actually clean, messy fun. So okay. and, and it smells really nice. Um, but I want everybody to also please share your photos of your challenge. Um, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. So be sure to share that in the comments. Thank you, Marlene. Is there anything else you'd like to add or are we going to grab some coffee? Yes, we're going to grab some coffee. Guys, have a fun time with this activity. And you're really, remember that lesson like that message, like don't be so hard on yourself, don't be so hard on your child. Um, we, we, we learn best when we are relaxed and when we are comfortable. So, yeah. And thank, thank you so much for watching us and thank you for having me, Crystal. It's lovely. Thank you, Marlene. I'm looking forward to next week as well. It's also going to be a really nice and practical one. And then please remember to grab the free, uh, freebie that um, the link is in the comments. Cheers, everyone. Bye.